Hi, everyone. Welcome to NYC FinTech Women's premier event, Talk with the Titans. We're so excited that we could have uh, all of these folks together to share all kinds of interesting information and I think some fun fact finding that will have all of us uh, excited to be here. I'm Nicole, New York Lead and Events Chair for NYC FinTech Women. And tonight we're featuring guest and legendary investor, Leon, Lee Cooperman. We're so excited to have a virtual seat at the table with Lee tonight. I think you'll find his journey very interesting as the son of a plumber from the Bronx who attended public schools in Hunter College, earned his MBA from Columbia University, straight to self-made billionaire. A Wall Street legend, Lee built up Goldman Sachs Asset Management Division, and at the end of 91, retired from those positions as general partner of Goldman Sachs and chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs Asset Management to organize and launch an investment management business called Omega Advisors, Inc., which he ran for 27 years. And at its height, managed more than $10 billion in assets under management. Tonight, we have three powerhouse NYC FinTech women, Samantha, Keisha, and Kate, who will be engaging with Lee to fireside chat, all kinds of questions, topics ranging from his start in investing, his unique approach to taking on risk, uh, improving representation in the workforce, and how he plans to give away most of his $2.5 billion assets. Lee will share 15 minutes of his remarkable life's wisdom and market outlooks via a few slides. Then we'll open up the forum for our incredible moderators, Samantha, Keisha, and Kate, to introduce themselves and get us rolling with some terrific questions. So Lee, the virtual floor is yours. And you might need to unmute your line. There you go. Okay, very good. All right. So let me just, again, thank you for your gracious comments. Uh, I'd say good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. I have found sessions like this over the years that there is valuable to you as a quality of your questions and uh, we can have a slight format. I asked for about 15 minutes to, to high, highlight my views of certain things. And we've agreed that the questions will be asked by Keisha, Samantha, and Kate. So hopefully they understand what interests you and they'll ask me the right questions. This handout is available to you should you want it. And uh, again, let's go. I thought I'd give you a little bit about my background, my approach to business and life, synopsis of my investment outlook, should that be of interest to you, and some observations about hedge funds. My goal in part is to share with you some of the more important things I've learned in my lifetime. I guess at age 77 and being an investor for over 50 years, I'm entitled to be a bit of a philosopher. And given my diverse background, and Nicole mentioned some of it, or a lot of it, uh, I can respond to your questions from many vantage points. Um, Number one, I say I'm a poor kid out of the South Bronx that became successful, so I can speak to the issue of being poor and being rich. That one is easy, rich is better. Second, I've been a sell-side research analyst uh, at Goldman Sachs, a sell-side portfolio strategist, I call it a pontificator, a chief investment officer of a major money management organization. And for the 26 years ended, uh, 2018, I've been a hedge fund manager, well before it was, it used to be the in thing. I'm now retired. Uh, I tell everybody I feel a little bit like uh, Hyman Roth in Godfather 2. I've seen that movie a hundred times, never get tired of it. But there's a scene at the airport where right before Hyman Roth gets shot, he professes that he's a retired executive living on a pension. And I tell people I'm a retired money manager living on investment income. The bad news is I no longer have active income, you know, no income from clients. All my income is dividends, interest, capital gains, and losses. And the good news is I have no pressure. I manage my own money, and I'll talk about this later. I've taken a giving pledge with Warren Buffett. I intend to give away not half my money. I intend to give away all my money. So uh, I'm really working for charity. Uh, and I feel very good about uh, not having the pressure, particularly in an environment like we're in, which is kind of crazy. Third observation I would make, I was a chairman of the audit committee for almost 20 years of a $62 billion capitalization corporation called uh, Automatic Data Processing. So I think I understand the issues of uh, 
Sarbanes-Oxley and corporate governance. And finally, I have a lot of philanthropic involvements and have a view towards philanthropy. Uh, it was a great trip from my beginnings in the South Bronx to where I stand here or sit here today. I should be an inspiration to all of you in the audience that with an average IQ and a strong work ethic with a heavy dose of good luck and a certain amount of intuition, you can go far. As Nicole mentioned, uh, you know, uh, most of my education was in the public school system. You know, my father came to America from Poland at the age of 12 as a plumber's apprentice, um, no formal education. I got my, I went to public school in the South Bronx, PS 75. I went to high school in the South Bronx, Morris High School. I then followed the advice of Harlan Screeley. I went west and I went to Hunter College in the West Bronx, uh, now called Lehman College, part of the City University of New York. When I got out of Hunter, I worked for about 18 months in Rochester from New York for Xerox Corporation, and then returned to New York to attend Columbia University Graduate School of Business. And I got my MBA, and that, frankly, that advanced degree is what opened the door to Wall Street. Not that it's right, uh, but um, I probably couldn't have gotten into Goldman Sachs without that MBA. Myself, I prefer to hire PhDs. Uh, I refer to them as poor, hungry, and driven uh, graduates. You know, I don't hire with a pedigree. Uh, business and personal philosophy, uh, you can go to slide one. Ever since it was introduced to the marketplace, I've used a men's cologne called Obsession by Calvin Klein. And frankly, you know, this is me. That doesn't mean it works for everybody. That is the word that I would use to describe my approach to business. Not only uh, is investing my vocation, it's my advocation and has proven to be a means to supplement my income. My, my income. So it's kind of all consuming. And my little translation is the harder I work, the luckier I got. And I would say hard work never killed anybody. Uh, and look at the first chart. Everybody laughs when I show them this chart, but it has great relevance to our business. I don't hire anybody when I was in business without telling them the story about the gazelle and the lion. Uh, not that you needed to re me to read it to you, but every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up, knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or will be killed. And every morning a lion wakes up and knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up, you better be running. And the relevancy to our business is very simple. Roundly speaking, there are roughly 10,000 mutual funds that are happy to manage your money for 1% or less. In fact, I think just in the last 12 months, Fidelity introduced a uh, index fund, zero fees. Um, and then there are called 10,000 hedge funds that have the audacity or the chutzpah to ask for some variation of one or 2% in 20 uh, to manage your money. And I would just say premium fees command premium performance. You can't expect a premium fee for subpar performance. So, you know, uh, if the US equity market was uninteresting, I felt I had to find something that made sense to develop expertise to find a way of generating alpha and incremental return. Um, and uh, so no matter, you just got to basically be on the balls of your feet constantly. There's no resting in your laurels. I never wanted to go into a, a, a client meeting making a lot of money and underperforming some mindless index. Um, my first, you know, now I go through some of the lessons of life, exhibit two. Um, or, uh, I would like to modify this. Uh, you know, was, this was 1900 when Andrew Carney says, I wish to have my epitaph, here lies a man I would say a man or a woman who was wise enough to bring into a service men or women who knew more than he. And that, that was been the secret of my success. Don't be threatened by strong people. Be, fended, be benefited by capable and motivated associates. Look for the very best people to part, be part of your organization and share the economics fairly. Okay, and I think that's very, very critical. I've had some very critical associates, uh, both men and women, you know, one of the senior people in my credit group was a woman, Rebecca Packholder. She did an excellent job for me. I don't know if she's a member of your group or not. Uh, my uh, chief compliance officer was a woman. And basically, everybody got compensated similarly. If you were on a P&L basis, you got 5% of your P&L, uh, regardless of gender. And if, if you generated a higher return on equity than I expected, uh, then uh, you got more. So anyway, I, I echo Andrew Carnegie's words. Um, my personal philosophy of life is very simple. I summed it up about 12 years ago when I took my entire family. I have three grandkids, 
uh, 22, 19, and 12, two daughters-in-laws and two married sons. And, and I took them away from all expenses paid vacation, my 65th birthday. My timing was impeccable. We went to the Greenbrier and six months after we went there, they went bankrupt. I told my family that statistically a male that survives to the age of 65 will on average live to about 85. The good news is if I'm average, I have about a decade left. The bad news is I've lived a large percentage of my life in front of computer terminals investing. But I gave them four observations that I will share with you. Uh, I think are very important. There's nothing more important than family. They root for you and care more about you than most, so stay close to your family. I'm very pleased and I'm very close to my grandkids, my, my children. Um, and, uh, you know, I keep saying that my kids come home, which is a good thing. Second, to, it's great to have friends, but to have friends, you have to be a good friend. Be trusting, friendly, and supportive of your friends. Extend yourself whenever you can. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the only way to have a friend is to be one. And third, uh, despite my SEC investigation, never do anything in life that where you did appear in the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, you would be embarrassed. I won the case. Uh, the SEC is very venal. Uh, we could talk about, you know, nothing is off limits. You could talk about anything you want to talk about. But uh, I, I conduct your life like it's an open book, you know, and uh, um, that's the way I, my philosophy. And finally, you know, there are varying degrees of uh, financial accomplishment on this call. Uh, this observation might be further away for some of you, but when you have achieved financial security, you share your success with others less fortunate than yourself. In a biblical sense, we are our brother's keeper, and we have a moral obligation to help others in need. Go to the next slide. Uh, I tell people, it's, uh, you know, and this is this is the reputational. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. But when character is lost, all is lost. The Reverend Billy Graham. Like I said, it fits with the notion of conducting your life as an open book. Uh, next exhibit, basically, um, William Lynn Phelps, never met the man. First test of a gentleman is respect for those who can be of no possible value to him. Okay, no matter how rich you are, in my view, one luxury you cannot afford is arrogance. Be nice to people, treat them, people below you no differently than people above you. Believe me, I've seen people that are very nice to superiors, but are nasty to subordinates. I saw that in the real world many years ago when a Goldman Sachs salesman, myself, and uh, a very, very fine gentleman, one of the finest guys I've met in the business, went out uh, with a money manager. The uh, idea behind the dinner was this gentleman, uh, I'll tell you what it was, Ken Langone, was going to put an account in the lap of this money manager. When Ken saw how nasty he was towards the staff, the waiter, uh, he never brought the subject and he never put money with him. So uh, I would say the first test of a gentleman, respect for people that can be of no possible value to you. Very, very important. I also preach engagement. You know, Aristotle said tolerance and apathy are the last virtues of, of a society. Speak up, make your voices heard. Don't be a bump in a log. Okay, and I say, the best way to make money in a business is not to think much, too much about making it. That's Henry Ford, Warren Buffett has repeatedly said, tap dance to work, go to work for somebody you respect and admire, and everything will take care of itself. Don't go into a field for money. Go into a field because you have a passion for it and you have an aptitude for it. I've been very often said, which is uh, you know, under the same theme, the best way to be successful is do what you love, love what you do. I've worked 70 hour weeks for 50 odd years and I never looked at his work. I always enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy finding something somebody else doesn't see, making a bet, having Mr. Market prove me right. That's kind of what I find most exciting. Now at this stage of my life, I take those profits and I give it away to help others less fortunate. Uh, Albert Einstein, only a life lived for others is a life worth living. You don't associate the quote with Pablo Picasso, but the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. I found my gift. Uh, my gift was extracting profits in the market, and I got a lot of things uh, that I'm giving it away to. Um, if you go to the next slide, I have a granddaughter who's a star. She just graduated Stanford University. She's destined for the nonprofit world. 
She wants to make the world a better place. And uh, she posed the questions from Rabbi Hillel, and then she gave her answers. I don't read it, I get a little choked up. That's Courtney's words, you can read it for yourself. And then many, many years ago, I read a quote by William Ward, and it struck me as being very intelligent. And I've tried to live that my life that way, and it's worth thinking about. Before you speak, listen. You know, before you write, think. Before you spend, earn. Before you invest, investigate. Before you criticize, wait, words hurt. Before you pray, forgive. Before you quit, try. Before you retire, save. And I'm in the last round. Before you die, give. I think that's very excellent advice. Um, and um, I, I have followed that advice all my life. Next exhibit, you know, um, I won't dwell on it, but uh, these are characteristics I look for people. You have already chosen your career. A lot of times I speak to young kids that are in graduate school or, you know, finishing up undergraduate school. And I tell them what I look for in a money manager or an analyst. And if these items don't resonate with you, you should look for a different line of work or at least not interview at Omega or firms like Omega. Next is exhibit seven. Uh, everybody thinks the uh, hedge funds are a road paved to gold. It's not the case. This was an exhibit out of a 1970 article written by one of the most distinguished reporters at Fortune magazine, excuse me, Fortune magazine, um, Carol Loomis. Okay, and that was after the 1968-1970 bear market and she wrote an article with the headline, Hard Times Come to Hedge Funds. And she pointed out how with the exception of Steinach, Fine and Berkowitz, most of them got cremated. Uh, well, the fact is the article was uh, only right for a very short period of time. At that time, the entire hedge fund industry was probably a billion dollars. The hedge fund industry today from what I read is about uh, three trillion. So there's always gonna be a room for intermediary. The question is whether you can provide results that demand a premium fee. And if you can, uh, you'll be successful. If you can't, uh, you'll get into a different line of work or a different type of product, a different strategy. Uh, next exhibit, um, uh, talk a little bit about my market outlook. And again, we're gonna throw this over for questions where I can elaborate on things. Um, I'm going to read you uh, about two months ago, somebody sent me an email, I a guy I respected, and asked him what I thought about the market. And I wrote him in response, and this is my view. And you should be aware, I'm not a, 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 a skeptic, I'm not a short seller. Uh, I am basically a guy that made my fortune, um, you know, in, in investing in the long side. But I said to this guy, my view is simple. The economy has been on some form of life support since 2008. This should reduce price earnings ratios, all things being equal. We never made it out of QE, and now it's free money for a long time. No one seems to care about massive debt being created. I do. Lastly, multiples, that's P ratios, are a function of growth rates, confidence, and interest rates. Future growth is likely to be less than historical, given the need to allocate more of our income to debt service. I think it's fair to say confidence in the future is less. I'm not talking about a cyclical rebound here. I'm talking about long term. That leaves us with rates, which are clearly driving the market. Two observations. One, if interest rates belong where they are, your returns in the stock market should be well under 5%. And second, sec central bank policy towards rates seems wrong to me. And I'm, I'm just captured or possess from the concern, who pays for the party when the party is over? You know, this nation just celebrated its 244th birthday. It took 244 years to go from no national debt to 21 trillion. That number is going up three or four trillion dollars a year. That's a growth rate far in excess of the growth rate in the economy. And somewhere that's gotta be dealt with. And, uh, I don't know who pays the party when the party is over, but I'd be the first to admit you don't know when it's over. Uh, uh, my favorite story is in 1972, there were very two distinguished gentlemen, both are deceased, Henry Fowler, former Secretary of the Treasury, who was a Goldman Sachs partner at the time, and Pete Peterson uh, of uh, uh, Blackstone, 
and basically uh, black rock, I get black rock, black stone, black stone. And uh, they were very civic minded citizens and they ran full page ads in 1972, alerting Congress and the public to the evils of the budget and trade deficit. Well, here we are now, uh, 48 years later, and the only significance of the deficit, which is much worse now than it was then, we have the lowest interest rates in the history of the world. So you can't tell when this stuff hits, but I believe uh, that it will hit. And so uh, I have a very conservative outlook, um, and I thought I would put together some charts that kind of make that point. The next chart, next exhibit nine, which is a positive one, this chart shows you what the real Fed's fund rate was prior to every recession and every bear market. Unfortunately, I just see now that the year was left off the bottom. We gotta fix that uh, in the next rendition of the chart. Uh, let me just see if my version has it. Um, but the point that you see there is the real fund, Fed funds rate was positive, uh, consequential positive, 2% in the first instant. Uh, yeah, I have it, that was 1960. The first line is 1960. The second uh, period was 1970. That was over 4% real. Then in 1975, it was 6% uh, uh, real. 1980, it was between eight and 10% real. 1990 cycle, it got up to 6% real. 2000, it was 4% real. 2010, it was 4% real. The real Fed fund rate now is a negative 2%. It's way below anything you've ever seen at previous bear market lows. So interest rates are having a lot effect on the market. In my opinion, what the Fed is doing is they're forcing everybody out on the risk curve. You know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you were comfortable holding two bills, the T-bill buyers said, I can't survive on zero or 10 base points, I'm gonna buy T-bonds and take duration risk. The T-bond buyer says, I can't survive in 70 basis points, I'm gonna buy industrial credits. The industrial credit buyer says, I can't survive in 3%, I'll buy high yield. The high yield buyer says, well, I can't get by in four or 5% or 6%, okay, I'm gonna buy structured credit. And the structured credit person says, well, you know, I can't get by on the structured credit yield, which isn't too bad, by the way. I have a lot of money in that area. Uh, I'm gonna buy, put 25% of my fixed income fund in equities. Um, and uh, um, basically uh, that's what's going on. And one day we'll move back on the risk curve. If you look at exhibit 10, um, this again points out uh, from 1960 to 2012, the multiple in the S&P average about 15. When the inflation rate was one to 3% where it is now, the average multiple was 17. We're currently 21. So we're well above historical norms, but look at the right hand column. When the multiple in the market was 15, the 10 year government averaged 6.2%, currently 70 bips. The average Fed's fund rate was 5% is currently near zero. So relative to interest rates, basically uh, the market is cheap. The question really is how do you relate to current interest rates? And I, I think that they're ridiculous. I think they're a bubble. And finally, exhibit 11 works into my market view. I think talking about the S&P is too simplistic. I think today I've identified three markets. There's what I call the FANG market, which are the beneficiaries of the virus where demand has been pulled forward and they're the equivalent of the new Nifty 50. The problem, and they're not expensive. The Nifty 50 in 1972 was substantially more expensive than Nifty 50 today. And I will point out that the 10 year government in 1972 is 6.5%. Currently, as I mentioned, is 70 basis points. The trouble with it is I can't even tell you that today's Nifty 50. I own the big ones like you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera. But if you go back and look, the companies that are in this slide were considered nifty 50 in 1972. Avon, 65 times earnings. Eastman Kodak, 48 times. IBM, 37 times, now 10 times. Kmart, gone, 34 times. Polaroid, gone, 90 times. Revlon, essentially gone, 30 times. Sears Robot, gone, 31 times. Kresge, Kmart, 34 times, gone. Xerox, 41 times. The Japanese crushed them in their market. 
So if you take the fangs, which are not expensive, and put a normal failure rate, say of the 50 today, today's nifty 50, that 20% turn out to be a big disappointment, basically you wind up with an expected return, not all that impressive. The second market I have nothing to do with, um, and that's what I call the Robinhood market. Those are, I think, 13 or 14 million 30-year-olds that are trading the market in and out that have the benefit of zero commissions, zero cost of money, uh, and getting government refund checks more than they make working. That's the only explanation I can give you when uh, Carl Icahn, who is smart as they come, recognizes a mistake and hurts sells at his position at 72 cents a share, and three weeks later is trading at $5 in bankruptcy. Well, the enterprise value of American Airlines today is higher than it was pre-COVID because of all the equity and debt they've issued. And I've seen, you know, uh, whether it's Kodak going from two to 60, 60 to eight, I don't know where it trades now, but basically these are the uh, Robinhood traders that I don't think know anything about what they're doing that mark will end in tears. It's not fundamentally driven. Um, and uh, I don't play in that market. The third market is the rest of the market. And frankly, I could find a lot of value. And my only limitation is frankly, uh, limiting uh, myself to my uh, overall exposure. The last exhibit uh, I want to go through is exhibit 12. This is very important. And this evidence is my thinking. So I am not making, you know, 10 year forecast, but what this exhibit shows you when you bought into the market, when it was selling above 22 times earnings, historically the fully return has been very uninspiring. Okay. The five year return has been near zero. Okay. I will tell you, I got my MBA from Columbia business school on January 31st of 1967. I was broke. I had a six month old kid. I had no money in the bank. Okay. Uh, I had my Goldman Sachs job offer. I couldn't afford a vacation. I went to work the next day to Goldman. I started my career at Goldman in February 1st, 67. The Dow was roughly 1,000. 14 years later, it was 1,000. Now I'm not making 14-year forecast, eight-year forecast, or 10-year forecast. I think we're in store for a period where interest rates will rise gradually, uh, profits go up, multiple in the market will decline. I think your overall averages will not make you much money. I still think stocks well selected are the best place to be. I think the bubble is bonds, not stocks, but I'm very uninspired uh, by the market outlook as I see it uh, presently. So that's all I wanted to say formally. And I've agreed to respond to any questions on any subject that I feel qualified to respond to. And I hope what I've said makes some sense to you. But uh, ladies, you go ahead. Right. Who, uh, Samantha, are you leading or Keisha? I... Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to, to go first. Uh, thank you, Lee. So I'm Keisha Allison. I'm a head of content for Money 2020 USA. And Money 2020, for those who don't know, is the uh, US's largest gathering of the money ecosystem. So through our events, we bring uh, and create a space for the industry to connect, learn and share. Um, the latter is where I come in as head of content, the learning and the sharing of ideas. I'm in charge of the research and the programming um, that we ultimately deliver at our shows. So that is a little bit of who I am and really excited, especially after hearing, um, you know, Leon give his take on the market and also on just his, some of his philosophies that he's lived by um, to jump into this conversation. And I'm glad that uh, New York City FinTech Women is having this event and hope that they do more. I think uh, the learning and sharing that I'm used to at Money 2020, I'm seeing it in all different channels and I'm happy um, that there isn't an outlet like that for us to continue to do so in times that sometimes feel a little bit isolating. Um, and it's also great for community building. Um, even more excited, Leon, to be chatting with you, not just because um, I picked up that you're a Hunter alumni and we're both products of public city, um, New York City public um, school, but um, it's not often that we have a chance to ask you anything, as you say, you know, everything's on the table, um, which is amazing. And I'm really looking forward to getting your perspective on the evolution of the industry. Good. Well, 
That was a statement rather than a question. Um, I'm going to just introduce myself quickly. My name is Sam Azzarello. I'm an economist, a global market strategist at JP Morgan. So I follow market. You're my banker. JP Morgan is my bank. Fabulous. And um, I'm really happy to be here just because I think given everything that we're going through, there's so much we can learn from really interesting, amazing people. And Lee, you are obviously one of those people. And thank you for being candid and open with us. And then I'm going to turn it to Kate to introduce herself before we get to the Q&A. Sure. Um, I am Kate Drew. I'm the Director of Research at CCG Catalyst Consulting. I manage our pipeline of research content, both on the client side and externally. Our focus uh, and my focus is on banking and financial services, as well as fintech. We really try and hone in on the intersection between the two. Uh, I'm also really excited to be here. I've worked with NYC FinTech Women for a couple of years now. I think they've done an incredible job building a really vibrant network of women in the city. And I'm also very much looking forward to chatting with Leon. I have heard him speak before, and I think this is going to be a real treat. I'm looking forward to getting to ask him all of my questions. Um, you know, I, I love that, that you're putting everything out there on the table. So really excited for this conversation and, and very happy to be here too. Thank you. Awesome. So now that we're all introduced, Lee, they've put me in the hot seat and I'm the one that's supposed to kick off uh, with our first question. So happy to do so. And, you know, as Sam, Kate and I were talking about what we wanted to ask you with this opportunity, I think one of the most striking things was your resume. You went through some of you know, your, your career accomplishments and, and things that you've seen. And clearly you've chosen a path to success. So my first question to you is, um, you know, from where you're sitting now, what do you attribute that success to? Okay, well, I would say hard work, luck, and intuition. Hard work is self-explanatory. When I was fully engaged in business, I opened up the lights and I shut the lights off. I got in at 6.45 in the morning. Uh, if you go over to our office, which I still have, I can't wait till my lease expire. I got office space for 50 people, but I only have eight people in the family office. But I hung up every picture myself in the office. It was 18,000 square feet. Um, and I got in early, stayed late, and I worked very hard. To this day, I worked very hard. I had a lot of luck. Um, and uh, I had good intuition. And the last one is what deserves the most explanation. Because at the end of the day, you know, you got to make your own luck in life. So I'll give you two examples of the importance of intuition. Um, back in the 60s, if you finish your major and minor in college in three years, they allow you to count your first year of medical or dental school towards your fourth year of college, and you get a separate degree. So you're looking, to a, you're looking at a guy right now who went to dental school for eight days and quit. Now, I know you, I see the big smile on your face. <laughs> it was a very traumatic time in my life. Because why? I basically, I, in the summer of 1963, I took physical chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. That finished off my major. And I enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania Dental School. I paid my tuition for a year. I paid my room and board for a year. I drilled my initials LC into $1,200 worth of equipment. They say, tell you things have a way of disappearing in the laboratory drill your initials into your equipment so you got the equipment back at the end of the class session. And after eight days, I was wondering if I was pushing myself in the right direction. And I had to go to the dean of, uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania Dental School, which is a very highly regarded dental school. I went to the dean, he put me on a guilt trip. He said, Mr. Koopman, how could you after eight days say you don't want to be a dentist? I said, I don't say I don't want to be a dentist. I don't know that I want to go to dental school for four years, not knowing I'm fully committed. So I'd like to go back to undergraduate school, finish off my uh, fourth year, unencumbered by any decision, and then make a, a decision after the fourth year. Uh, he put me on a guilt trip, said you deprived the, you deprived the 101st applicant to the dental education. I wasn't smart enough at that time to realize he could have gone to somebody in the wait list and he could come in after eight days. The only guy that understood what I was going through was the Dean of Hunter College, a guy by the name of Glenn T. Nygren, who's deceased. He said, it's a very courageous decision. Of course, you can matriculate back in. I went back in and I had all electives available. I took 10 courses in economics. I got 10 A's. I had a strange situation. My major was chemistry and mine was math and physics, but I graduated with honors in economics. I never looked back. And so uh, I think the most important thing is 
you know, go with your judgment. You, you have good, good intuition. My second example of intuition basically was Goldman Sachs. When I was interviewed in 1966 for a job, believe me, the market was at a high. I had 16 job offers, totally different in the world today. Uh, the, the Dow was at a thousand, it was at a high. Uh, I had a six month old kid. I was Beta Gamma Sigma, Wall Street Journal Student Achievement Award, straight A's in finance. So I was an attractive package. So I had 16 job offers. And one of the few times in my life, I did not respond on a timely basis to an offer. Uh, Goldman made me an offer for $12,500 a year. I didn't respond. The guy who made me the offer, he was deceased, Bob Danforth, very lovely guy from Yankton, South Dakota, called me up and said, Lee, we're disappointed we haven't heard from you. What can we say? He said, Bob, let me be honest with you. I'm dead broke. Um, I have no money. Uh, I have four offers that are more than Goldman Sachs has offered me, but I liked everybody I met there. And I was very familiar with the compound interest tables that Union Carbide had floating around at the time. And I said, you think I could make 25,000 a year after five years? That's a 15% compound to double in five years. And he said to me, if you work hard at keeping those clean, I think you can do it. He says, okay, I'm coming. Well, that was intuition because Goldman wasn't Goldman Sachs to emerge into. So I went with a firm based upon liking the people I met and making a judgment. And Goldman is about the only firm in the industry that I could think of that didn't change their name over a hundred, couple hundred years. Okay, so that was intuition. Went with the right people. And then I had a great career there. You know, uh, after nine years, I got invited into the partnership. I remember the invite came on the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend of 1976 with John Whitehead and John Weinberg, who were the co-senior partners of the firm at the time, called me up. Whitehead had a biting sense of humor. He says, Lee, we're sorry to do what we're about to do this way. We're going to invite you into the partnership. We're in the office working. You took the day off. I always took that Friday of Thanksgiving weekend to be with my kids. Okay, we're sorry to invite you in this way, but you, you took the day off. Uh, to put it in perspective, we're inviting you in as a partner. The firm is completing the best year in its history. We're going to earn $40 million pre-tax. We're going to come in at three quarters of 1%. And a salary of fifty thousand dollars, and you know we are, I hope you would now understand you got to start working for a living, not like you didn't work your tail off for nine years to become a partner. So if you take three quarters of one percent of forty million, that's two hundred thousand, and a fifty thousand dollars salary is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, they went from forty million dollars of pre-tax earnings in nineteen seventy-six to one point eight billion in nineteen ninety-one, the year I retired. My percentage went up every couple of years. So I went with a great firm that had a great run and I was there for the whole run. Uh, God knows what they are now, hell of a lot more than 1.8 billion. So that another example of intuition, but you gotta be lucky in life. Um, and uh, I've been very lucky, went to the right firm. I went to the right industry. You know, I could have gone into a sunset industry, you know, and you know, when I interviewed at a business school, uh, I biggest challenge when I was interviewing is I had two resumes. One said, desire position of finance staff of major multinational corporation, thinking at that time, the General Foods, Standard Oil of New Jersey, now Exxon, uh, I mean, a corporate position. And the other resume said, desire position of finance in the research department of major Wall Street investment banking firm. And the big challenge was remembering whether I was talking to General Foods or Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, not tripping myself up. Uh, and I wound up going to Wall Street and it was the right place for me and I, and I prospered. So I say, to answer your question, luck, hard work and intuition. And I, and I tell that to my kids, you know, my son, my older boy is nothing short of brilliant. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Stanford. His best job offer when he graduated Stanford was the Goldman Sachs trading program. And I told him, be careful, that's indentured servitude, that's not you. <laughs> he calls me up after four months and says, I'm gonna quit. You would, uh, you'd be disappointed. You came for me for advice. So I said, I'm going to tell yeah. you three things. Uh, number one, do me a favor. Tell the guy who runs the trading program you're unhappy. He's not going to give a damn, but he's got a boss. And when they review how the different tradees are doing, he'll put his boss in alert that you're not thrilled about things. Second thing, that uh, you understand you've got to make a living independent of me, so you have to have a plan subsequent to leaving Goldman. And number three, I was, uh, I'm happy that you asked my advice. And I told my story about dental school. And he was very successful. He wound up going to work for money management. He went back to school, got an MBA from Wharton, ran a hedge fund for 15 years, very successful. And he was smarter yeah. than me. He retired at age 50. <laughs> I, I worked at 76. 
that's that intuition that you were talking about. Um, I think, you know, I know you gave us three bits there, but that's the one that I took away most from is trust your gut. Um, and you kind of knowing that that wasn't the route for you and speaking up was probably the best decision you made, right? And it's landed you where you are. Yeah, so I'm going to take it off. And, I have my hand in people's yeah. pockets. Now I don't have my hand in their mouth. And I found out later that the uh, dentist profession, the dentist profession has the highest rate of suicides among professionals is they're inflicting pain constantly and they work in a very concentrated area. But oh. uh, well, see their intuition. I'm glad it worked out. I'm going to, I know we're doing a nice round robin. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Kate um, for her to ask her question. Sure. I, I think that point on, in, on intuition feeds nicely into this because I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your approach to decision making and versus how you started out and now. I, I can imagine that when you first started out, there was just you know a, a real dearth of information, very little reporting, um, and then fast forward to today and it's information overload. So I, I imagine your approach to decision making and research has evolved over time. So can you talk a little bit about your overall approach to investing in decision making and, and how it's changed as you've moved through your career? Yeah, well, I, I would say, look, when I started, there was no 8Ks, 10Ks, there was no FD, et cetera. You know, an analyst covered 100 companies. Now, analysts think they're overloaded if they cover eight companies. So, uh, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. You have an overload of information. You got to decide how to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, ben Graham, in the classic book, uh, The Intelligent Investor, said that analysts evaluate management twice in the decision-making process. Once to the numbers. After all, companies return on equity, return investment, growth rate, profit margins, industry position is a measure of the quality of management. So I look at the numbers very carefully, but I also, uh, I don't take any meaningful position in the company without having the opportunity to be exposed to management, where I go face to face, belly to belly in management, ask them questions and see how they respond to questions. Uh, so it's a very, you know, management numbers intensive approach. I like free cash flow. I like management ownership. I like, you know, stringent capital allocation. I like low multiples. Um, I, I tend to be a classic value, but I decry the current approach between, you know, value and growth because, you know, is, is Google value is Google growth. I, I think it's growth at a very reasonable price. So I, I, I tend not to engage in a debate of value versus growth. I look at each company on its own and it's through management interrogation and through the numbers. How, how do you balance your quantitative strategy or approach with your intuition? I guess through valuation, you know, and when you basically find something that's in the absolute right economic sector, the economist likes it, your uh, uh, analyst likes it, uh, it's got the right valuation, and the technician likes it because it's got a chart that's an ascending you know, pattern and it's above its 200 day moving average, you buy it and then you can wind up losing money. So, you know, uh, it, it's judgmental, you know, and uh, I like companies that have been tested, have been through a recession or two that are real, but I do have a proclivity to go off the run. You know, um, things are so well covered now. You go on Bloomberg, you could probably have 50 or 100 people cover Google. What am I going to add to that? You know, so I, I tend to go to things that are less well uh, researched where I could add the uh, additional value. And I would say free cash flow, ROE versus multiple is what drives me. It's, it's also uh, funny that you mentioned the 50 stocks versus the, uh, or the 100 stocks versus the eight stocks for analysts. I started my career out at uh, the Value Line Investment Survey and I was covering 50 stocks at the time. And I thought that that was a lot, so. I hired a guy, I won't mention his name, that's sorry to interrupt you, uh, in 1972 to replace me. What happened, I, I was promoted to become partner in charge of research. And I, at the time I was a retail analyst at Goldman. I brought in a fellow to replace me and he insisted in his interviewing that he'd be able to follow uh, retail, vending, home furnishings, a whole bunch of industries. And by the time I retired from Goldman, and he was still there, he was complaining to me he was overworked following eight stocks. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and that's from the amount of information that's been made available. Right. Uh, but a lot of that information 
is not necessarily productive. Right. You know, right. Warren Buffett sits in Omaha, you know, uh, running a two hundred billion dollar corporation, and I'm sure you know he doesn't need all the information that's made available to him. No, I, I mean, there, I think that there's so much information now that it, it's actually really hard to, like you said, separate the wheat from the Well, it's like when you went to school, you had to know what to study for in the test. Of course. I, I'm going to keep us moving here because um, I know that we have a, a hard stop at 6.30. Uh, so I'm going to pass to Sam uh, for our next question. Thanks, Kate. So I wanted to ask you, Lee, about risk. Let's talk about risk, whether it's investment risk, which I feel like you're going to have views on, career risk, calculated risk. Basically, how do you think about this broadly? What have you learned over the years about risk taking? And do you think it's necessary to take conscious risk to get ahead or to make a big jump in a career or you know, life effectively? No, no I, I, I would say not. Uh, I had plenty of opportunities to leave Goldman Sachs uh, for superior offers at any point in time, uh, but I decided to play the long ball. So my resume is very short. I spent 25 glorious years at Goldman. I spent 26 years at Omega, uh, married 55 years to the same woman. We met in college, half sophomore year. So, you know, I believe in long marriages, long relationships, and long associations, as long as uh, you're enjoying what you're doing and that, you know, you're okay. So uh, I would say that uh, be patient and stick with your discipline. You know, uh, you got to understand your strengths. You know, I'm not a guy that rotates from one type of stock to another. You know, Stevie Cohn is a fabulous trader, but he has a knack for moving and figuring out the market. A guy that I have enormous respect for, he's brilliant. A guy who would admit to being very wrong in the last five years, but he delivers excellent performance, Stan Druckenmiller. He's had a more conservative view of the world and things have turned out. But when you look at his performance, you can see that he, he moves with the flow. He figures out if he's on the wrong track relatively quickly, he changes tact and he gets himself properly positioned. So I have a lot of respect for him, both as a human being and as a performer. But I, I would say just understand your strengths. Uh, uh, myself, I, I like liquidity. I like, uh, you know, modest valuations. I like a company that's been through a couple of business cycles, et cetera. And I don't, uh, and, and, and you can see from my recommendations, I think they're going to get, we're planning to ask you about some stocks. Uh, I tend to go off the beaten path. I don't think I can add a lot of value uh, to some of the bigger companies. You know, my big positions are Ashland, Amazon, Cigna, Fiserv, uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, Safebook, Facebook. But, you know, I, I, I don't have any edge. I'm just making a market judgment there. But uh, I say stick with your discipline, understand your strengths, and don't go back and forth. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. Especially, I think, when it's easy to be pulled in different directions very easily because we're always getting things thrown our way. So. The whole market is, mechanism is broken. You know, I wrote a letter. It was totally ignored. I wrote a letter to Jay Clayton, head of the SEC, two years ago. And it was a very respectful, intelligent letter, but he never responded to it. And I explained to him that the market mechanism is broke. That basically, when I joined Goldman 50 odd years ago, they traded stocks at 25 to 50 cents a share, and the Volcker rule didn't exist. So, Goldman's and Morgan Stanley's in, of the world had the ability to position and take on risk because the Volcker rule didn't prohibit them. And they also got a 25 to 50 cent spread by the commission that compensated for risk taking. Today, the commissions are near zero, and the Volcker rule prohibits them from doing that. Secondly, 80% of the stocks traded 25, 30, 40 years ago was done in the New York Stock Exchange. Today, 80% of the stocks are off the board. So the specialist system does not function as a stabilizing entity. And thirdly, and most importantly, in 1938, they enacted the uptick rule, which required a plus tick to short a stock. For some unexplained reason, I think in the interest of uh, driving down trading costs, they eliminated the uptick rule in 2007 that gave rise to the quantitative trading systems, not to, you know, your, your name of your organization is FinTech, but, you know, I think all these quantitative traders know nothing about value, they know everything about price. So they buy strength, they sell weakness, they ag exaggerate the moves in the market. It's made it very difficult to operate in the market. And this market, when it goes down, I didn't focus on the slide about what causes bear markets, but when the conditions for a bear market 
arrive, this market's going to go down so fast and so quick, so dramatically that your head's going to spin. You saw that a little bit in the fourth quarter of 2018. With no economic justification, you had the worst quarter since the Great Depression. Turned out there was nothing going on in the economy that caused it. It was just basically uh, absence of liquidity in the market. And everybody's- This makes it so interesting, Lee, talking to you is that you just have such a broad, you have such a long vantage point. So that's really helpful. And I know that Keisha wanted to ask you, talk about financial inclusion and empowerment and maybe how that's shifted. So I'm gonna turn it over to Keisha. Thank sure. you, Sam. So yes, thanks for teeing that up. You know, I just thought that I'd have to take you up on the opportunity. We're talking to, you know, an infamous investor here, and I wanted to chat a little bit about the wealth gap. Um, you know, fintech is very famous for the numerous products, platforms, tools, all the things that are supposed to get people to better manage their money and, you know, in turn, create a more inclusive financial system. But when you look at the gap, right, it's clear that there's still a good number of people left out of our financial um, services system. So I'd like to ask you, Lee, you know, why do you think that is and how could we course correct at this point and begin to, I guess, effectively close that gap um, and create opportunities for wealth generation, especially in underserved communities? And I feel like who better to answer that and give some advice than you? Well, you might not like the answer. But <laughs> I would say that the government has exacerbated the income gap including uh, our first uh, president of color, you know, Barack Obama. You know, in 2008, Bernanke saw the economy going down the toilet. He said, I got to turn around the economy. And he figured out the best way to turn around the economy is to get wealth up. Best way to get wealth up, you know, the Pagu effect, 5% of wealth changes work its way into consumption. The best way to get wealth up is get the stock market up. The trouble with that is 80% of the stocks are owned by 20% of the people. And so uh, there's been a disproportionate benefit to the stock ownership community. And what the government is trying to do is get back that uh, windfall by virtue of having a financial suppression environment where uh, the reward for being prudent and saving money is you get a negative return on your savings. Now, uh, the Democratic Party wants to have wealth tax and increase marginal tax rates um, and uh, they want to keep the return on savings negative. Now, my own view is the only way to deal with the wealth gap is through education. Okay, I have a signature event called Koopman College Scholars. I send 500 kids to college, 99.9% .9 of children of color, in Newark, New Jersey. Okay, um, and I notice I speak with them every year I meet with them. And I, uh, when I meet with them, I notice that 90% of them don't know their fathers, okay? And their grandmothers come, their mothers come, but the fathers don't come. And uh, uh, I think the, 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 the Jews of 100 years ago are the Orientals, not or I guess Asians, like I don't want to be improper, okay? Uh, the tiger moms. You got to have a family unit that emphasizes the importance of education. The average lifetime earnings of a college graduate is well in excess of a million dollars more than a non-college graduate. So my answer, which is it takes a while to achieve, is education, providing equal opportunity. I believe in teaching people how to fish, not giving them fish. So in my program, you have to show initiative. Number one, Franklin and Marshall de developed a three-week free pre-college program designed to explain to these kids what to expect when you go to college. Number two, you got to basically live in Essex County, New Jersey, where I lived for 50 years. I'm now a Florida resident going back to 2011. I beat uh, Paul Singer, Carl Icahn <laughs> by 11 years. I did it because of my age and my arthritis. I, I love it down here. It has nothing to do with taxes. Though I think the problems will become much more acute. You know, um, you know yeah. Andrew Cuomo made a comment a year ago, which I thought was really not too swift. He said, people are leaving New York over the weather. They're not leaving New York over the weather. They're leaving New York because of the oppressive tax structure. Okay, I don't want to get off. Like, we can get on that point a little bit later on, maybe if I don't, won't forget it. But I, I think my answer to your question mm -hmm. is the, we got to give equal opportunity to young children of color to basically have the opportunity to work hard, get an education, um, and work their way into the labor force. Part of the reason I'm negative on Fed policy 
but you work your entire life today, you accumulate a million, two million dollars at the end of the run. That's a lot of money for most people in today's society. You go to your financial planner and you say, what can I earn in my savings? And he tells you very little. So you can't afford to retire, okay? Uh, you have to remain working past retirement age. That reduces the opportunity for young people to enter the labor force, okay? If you're a corporation and you have an assumed return on your pension assets of six or 7%, and you're in a world where you can't earn it, it creates real problems. <laughs> so I think the world is turned upside down. Uh, it's gonna be slow to normalize. But to answer your question most directly, my answer is education. You gotta provide an opportunity for education. These are splendid youngsters. They're very bright. I get very teary-eyed when I meet with the kids, uh, but you know they deserve an opportunity, and that's what we're doing. My, my grandchildren are involved. My wife is involved. My daughter-in-laws are involved. And it's a very gratifying plan. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I know you thought I wouldn't maybe like or agree with your answer, but I'm a thousand percent with you on that education piece. I do think that is you know where it all starts. I'm also in Essex County. Um, we got a lot of things in common, New York City Public School, Hunter, Essex County. Um, so no, that, that was a, a very Google, interesting and I think- Google College, the Google yeah. <laughs> College Scholars, there's a black lady by the name of Twinkle Morgan that runs the program and she's done a fabulous job. I put $25 million in a fund to send these 500 kids to college and they're really aggressive. They want me to double down, which I'm considering, you know, and I told them and they, and they're, they remembered the problem with it is 35% of new high school kids go to college. Historically, only 5% graduated. And I said, I, I work too hard for this money. I'm not putting this kind of money in a 5% graduation rate. Well, my first cohort graduates this year. We have a 73% graduation rate, which is fabulous. And I'll probably will double down because you're yeah. making a difference in the lives of people. You know? Yeah, well, that's I'm amazing. So and, uh, oh. I'm so sorry to interrupt, and I, I know we could go on all night, and I know we didn't get to <laughs> all the questions that we wanted, but um, we are at the top of the hour, and I, I wanted to uh, thank Lee and, and also turn it over to Michelle for a formal kind of thank you, Michelle being our fearless co-founder of this auspicious organization. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Tran, co-founder of NYC FinTech Women. Um, I do want to say a big thank you to Lee, Sam, Keisha, Kate, and Nicole for having this wonderful um, panel. I think, you know, the three things that I'm taking away are, Lee, you know, the three things that you said which carried you through your success. Hard work, luck, and intuition. Um, you know, that intuition piece being the most important and follow your gut. Um, so one, thank you guys all so much for joining one us. One I would like to get in with, we didn't have time, I don't want to run you too far over, but is uh, philanthropy. You, you ladies are all very successful in your own right. You know, I, I told Warren Buffett, and I think nine years ago, when I took the giving pledge, that if he's talking to wealthy people, asking for half is not asking for enough, nor is it original. I told him in 1900, Andrew Carnegie said, he who dies rich dies disgraced. In 1930s, so Winston Churchill said, you make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. In 1960, when President Kennedy was inaugurated president, he said, ask not what your country could do for you, ask what you could do for your country. And I told him that, you know, I'm Jewish, and I said, in the Talmud, you measure man not by what he gives. The difference between you, Warren, and me is I'm not going to give my money to Bill and Melinda Gates to give away. I'm going to give my money to those organizations that made a difference to me and my family in my lifetime. I get a lot of enjoyment out of giving. And I think that at the end of the day, if you think about it, there's only four things you could do with money. Okay, the first thing you could do with money is you could pleasure yourself. Buy art, buy homes, buy airplanes. I happen to be of the view that material possessions brings with it aggravation. So I, I'm of the view, less is more. I have everything I want in life. I have an undeniable philosophy. I want something, I get it. There's very little I want. I'm just happy with simple lifestyle. My wife is of a similar view. She was a learning specialist, worked with neurologically impaired, you know, birth defect children for 30 odd years. Okay, and so she was a worker like you ladies and she wasn't a consumer. Secondly, can give you money to your children, but if you have a lot of money, and I did at one time, uh, uh, not compared to what's going on now, uh, giving all your money to your kids is a mistake because you deprive them of self-achievement. Third thing you can do with money is give it to the government, but only a fool gives the government money you don't have to give them. You pay your taxes like a good citizen and that's it. Okay, but you don't give them more. And the fourth thing you do with money is recycle back into society. And that's what I decided to do with my money. So I would just put a pitch in for philanthropy. 
to those of you uh, on the call. Well, I think that's, I think actually that's the most impressive um, element about you, Lee, is that you're, you're, you signed the giving pledge and you're giving away your fortune. You've earned it and now you want to give it back to society. And I think that's what we all strive to do is to give back to our society. And that's one of the reasons too why we created this community is to give back what we have to all the women within FinTech to support each other as much as we can, either um, through connections, through networking, through empowerment, through sponsorship, and through philanthropy. Um, and one of the things, you know, again, big thank you to everybody. One of the things I want to make sure that we leave you with is part of that giving to each other is also supporting each other and promoting each other. Um, I do want to announce that NYC FinTech Women, we have launched our Inspiring FinTech Female List of 2020. This inspiring FinTech female list, what we strive to do is celebrate the women who are transformative in the industry as well as supportive of women. So part of that giving back, if you can't give back in a, in a monetary sense, you can give back by celebrating other women who you see achieving and really transformative. So I encourage everyone on this call um, to one, nominate either yourself or someone that you know who is transformative in FinTech. Um, as well as share with your network. We're super excited to celebrate all the amazing people, including the ones that we have today. And um, thank you again, you know, Sam, Nicole, Kate, Keisha, and a, a super big thank you to Leon for sharing your words of wisdom. Um, we are, we're so grateful and honored to have you uh, spend some time with us today. My pleasure. I wish all of you great success in your careers. I wish, Thank you so much. I, I wish I had my net worth and your age. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't go that way, though. But all the best. Thank you very much for asking me to do this. I, I, Thank I'm, you, everybody. Have a great night. You too.